Before the ages were named or numbered, our people were glorious and eternal and never changing. Like the great oak tree, they were constant in their traditions, strong in their roots, and ever reaching for the sky. In those ages, our people called all the land Elvenan, which in the old elven language means place of our people. And at the center of the world stood the great city of Arlathan, a place of knowledge and debate, where the best of the ancient elves would go to trade knowledge, greet old friends, and settle disputes that had gone on for millennia. Welcome once again, my dear students, to the next lesson in the course Dragon Age, the History and Lore of Thetis. Today's lesson will focus on one of the major races of Thetis, the continent's original inhabitants, the Elves. We will get an overview of the different periods of Elvish history up to modern day Thetis, Elvish culture and how it varies depending on group and time period, and a look at the religion and language of the elves. Now, we will go through a lot of history and lore in this lesson, and there will be events, periods and people, and so on, that will only briefly be mentioned or explained, but since the focus of this lesson is the basic understanding of elves and elven history, the other subjects will have separate in-depth lessons about them in the near future. So, with that out of the way, let's begin. The early history of the Elves, the graceful and pointy-eared race of humanoids, is one of wonder and magnificence, for they lived in a very different world from modern-day Thetis. Today, there exists two prime realities in the world, the material world and the Fade. The Fade is a metaphysical plane of existence filled with magic and spirits, where the laws of nature do not apply as they do in the real world. A boundary known as the Veil separates the real world from the ether of the Fade. None of that existed during early elven history. The real world and the Fade were one and the same, with no Veil separating the both of them. And it was in this world that the ancient elves lived, thrived, and slowly started forming their civilization. The ancient elves, the Elvhen, were not wholly corporeal creatures, but rather ethereal in nature. Immortal and unchanging, they lived in balance with nature and magic. Their innate ethereal connection to the arcane enabled them to explore the depths of the Fade, which they called the Sky, as it was not a separate world, but a physical part of their reality, and they also befriended many spirits during this time. The early elves lived in enormous floating cities and palaces high up in the heavens, but soon started expanding down to the surface of Thedas as well. The surface at this time did not belong to the elves, but was the domain of the legendary creatures known as the Titans. These Titans, the Pillars of the Earth, were gigantic creatures that lived below the surface of Thedas, and could shape and mold the stone around them. Tended to by their soulless children, the Titans rang out with a harmony of their own, one that the elf hen thought they could live side by side with and learn from. But while they were exploring the surface world and building new cities on the ground to mirror those up in the sky, mighty earthquakes began to ravage the continent. The cities and creations that the elves had built on the surface were thrown down and destroyed. And the elf hen quickly decided that if they could not live in harmony with the dissonant titans, they would instead tame the surface and make it their own by force. Thus, the war against the Titans started. 
This war marks the first recorded conflict in elven history, and maybe even in all of Theodosian history. After many hard battles, the elves finally defeated the titans by slaying one of the mighty creatures and sending its soulless children scurrying before them. Broken and defeated, the titans and its children returned to their home underground, falling into a deep slumber as the victorious elves started spreading across the surface and eagerly began mining the stone bodies of the titans for treasures. For the blood of the titans was made out of a rare and powerful magic enhancing mineral known as lyrium. With the titans defeated, the elves were now the undisputed masters of Thedas, and the elven civilization spread quickly over the surface of the continent. The leaders of the elf hen, mighty warriors, kings and mages all, declared the world as the rightful dominion of their species, and declared themselves to be gods of the elves, by merit of their own awesome power. Having successfully led them to victory against the titans, and allowing their civilization to spread successfully down to the surface, the elves, fueled by their victories, accepted this apotheosis, and recognized their leaders as gods. These gods came to be known as the Evanuris, whom we will return to in great detail later in the lesson. Thus followed the Golden Age of Elvenon, the ancient elven civilization. With the city of Arlathan in the north as its capital, its founding said to mark the start of the elven calendar with the year 1 FA, elven settlements, towns and cities were built all over the continent. Great temple complexes were also built to honor the elven gods who had made this empire a possibility and reality. But the advanced nature of Elvenon went beyond normal infrastructure, for the arcane gifts of the elves and their unhindered connection to the Fade meant that elven society became suffused with magic. To give an example, one of the many fascinating arcane creations of this time were the invention of Veilfire, this magically created fire could be used to inscribe runes and messengers, as well as obfuscate or reveal hidden spells and texts. Runes and texts written with the help of Veilfire were also able to transmit sight, sounds, smells, and other extraordinary senses directly into the reader's mind, making the meaning of the simplest of texts profound and animated. Furthermore, with mighty arcane rituals, the ancient elves created pocket dimensions by siphoning energy from the Fade and molding these dimensions after a certain purpose. One of these pocket dimensions were known as the Crossroads and were the ancient elves' primary use of travel. In every major settlement or significant place in the Empire, a magical mirror known as an Illuvion was constructed. These artifacts were all linked together via the crossroads, and by passing through one, you would be able to travel great distances over a very short time. By accessing the crossroads through the Illuvions, the elves were able to travel from one end of the continent to the other in mere moments. Other dimensions were dedicated to the preservation of knowledge as great libraries and archives, while others were entirely dedicated to any one of the elven gods. Since the pocket dimensions had been created with the power from the Fade, while at the same time not being entirely part of the Fade, both ethereal spirits and material elves could exist live and interact with each other in these pocket dimensions. In this highly advanced society, the elves were, as previously mentioned, immortal. 
They did not age, and could go on with their lives pursuing whatever skill or craft they wished. If the weight of centuries started to weigh on them, the elves could then enter into a voluntary prolonged slumber, known as Uthenera. In this process, the elven body would remain in the material world, while the spirit traveled to the Fade and wandered in dreams among the spirits for as long as it wished. Some would return to their bodies after a time, but others, content with this eternal slumber, would have recorded their memories in the previously mentioned pocket dimension before moving on. The Uthenera is a skill that highly trained elven mages can still perform even today. Now, it is important to understand that from a historical perspective, calling a period of the past a golden age might mainly be in reference to a period of overall societal, economical, or cultural splendor. But at the same time, the altogether human, or in this case, the elven down-to-earth perspective for the average person, might have been something completely different. Empires are, by their very nature, strict and often unjust hegemonies, and they are rarely creations bereft of hardship and toil. Elvenon was no exception to this rule. The Evanuris, the mighty mages and self-proclaimed gods of elven kind, who had led its kin into battle against the titans and conquered the surface, became the central linchpin of the Empire. The names Elganan the Allfather, Falondin the Guide, and Andruil the Hunter, among others, became very revered by their worshippers and followers. But this benevolence would not last. As the years went on, the Evanuris would turn cruel, arrogant, and power-hungry starting to abuse and mistreat the people that they were meant to lead. Being mages of immense power, they crafted artifacts known as foci to drag even more magical power out of the Fade. And with this power, the self-proclaimed gods instigated a rule of oppression and tyranny never before seen in this world. Tens of thousands of elves were enslaved by the Evanuris, their faces marked by tattoos called Valaslin that would serve as a mark of ownership to a specific god. The enslaved elves were used as disposable labor to build enormous temples, shrines and monuments to appease the petty whims of their masters. The Evanuris even began to war against each other in periods to satiate their own pride and vanity, and their respective slaves were used as meat shields and cannon fodder, as expendable champions to settle grudges, hunted like wild animals by crazed hunters. And for the heinous crime of denying that they were indeed real gods, the Evanuris branded anyone who stood against them, anyone who denied their godhood, these skeptics and naysayers, as the forgotten ones, undesirables and heretics to be persecuted and destroyed. Some slaves were deemed too valuable to be thrown away like the others by some of the gods, and these chosen slaves acted with far less constraints than the others. They were made to act as servants or sentinels overseeing temples and places of import to the god in question. But these few chosen with special privileges were very much the exception to the rule. Only two members of the Evanuris spoke out against this tyranny and resisted their fellow gods. The first one was Mithal, seen as the All-Mother and goddess of protection, who genuinely cared for her fellow elves. It had been Mithal who had slain one of the mighty titans during the first war, 
And now being the only voice of reason in a storm of ignorance, Mithal often mediated internal conflicts and chastised the other gods for treating their fellow elves in such a way, coming to blows with them on several occasions. The other opponent was an elf called Solas, later known as Fen'Harel, the dread wolf and the trickster god of the elves. Solas was a close friend of Mithal, and openly refused to call himself or any other member of the Evanuris gods, refuting the concept entirely. For this, the Evanuris slandered him with the name Dread Wolf. The wolf saw his presumptions of the recklessness of the Evanuris confirmed when, thousands of years after the fall of the Titans, the Evanuris greedily and arrogantly stumbled upon an unspeakable terror deep underneath the earth. Hastily, they ordered their slaves to seal the underground passages with magic and stone, and they swore to never speak of it again, as to conceal their mistake. This once and for all made it clear to Fen'Harel that these power-hungry mage despots were unfit to rule the elves, and so instigated an open revolt against the Evanuris. With his prime goal of freeing the elves from the slavery and tyranny of the Evanuris, the Dreadwolf broke the shackles of those he rescued from servitude, and magically removed their tattoos of ownership from their faces. Slaves from all across Elvanon flocked to his secret hideouts across the continent, and freed from their bonds, they joined the uprising under his banner. Led by the Dread Wolf, the army of freed slaves waged war against their former masters, both sides using the magic of the Illuvians to launch lightning attacks against their foes. As a result of this, many of the portals were strategically sealed to deny the other side their use in the revolt. In a final act of savagery, the Evanuris bounded together and murdered Mithal. Realizing that he could not kill them outright by himself, the Dread Wolf instead chose as a last act of revenge and defiance to banish the Evanuris from this realm. With the use of one of the foci, Fen'Harel performed a powerful ritual that split the world of Thedas and the Fade apart, creating the veil between them. This was an apocalyptic event. The innate connection that the majority of elves had with the Fade was severed, and due to this, the elves slowly began to age. Places and structures that the elves had built that were tied to the Fade, like the pocket dimensions of libraries and archives, were ruined and cut off, the knowledge of eons disappearing into the ether. Fen'Harel himself, weakened by the ritual, disappeared in its aftermath. What remained of the Elven Empire after the Veil was created was a shadow of its former self. Having lost so much of their former power and knowledge, filled with sorrow and mourning of what had been ripped from them, the Elven civilization slowly began to decline. Over the coming centuries, the Elves forgot more and more about their ancient history, losing the context that was needed to understand the past. This is, sadly, a running theme in the history of the Elves. Dating these events according to our modern perceptions of time is very difficult, and any attempts at dates and years will be a rough estimation at best. But we can make speculations and hypotheses. Since the capital of Arlathan was located on the surface of northern Thedas, the earliest history of the Elves and the war against the Titans might have taken place before the year 1 FA, before the elves migrated down to the surface, en masse, and the capital was constructed. Similarly, 
the golden age of Elvenon and the later slave rebellion of Fen'Harel might thusly have taken place from 1 FA to 3000 FA, when the elves encountered the dwarves. The encounter with the dwarves might have occurred during the Golden Age as well, we simply do not know. What we do know is that the Golden Age did not last up until the year 4500 FA, when the first humans arrived on the continent. At this point the Veil had already been created, and the Elven Empire had taken on a distinctly different nature culturally. Although bereft of much of their knowledge and identity, and the understanding of their ancient past escaping them more and more each year, the Elven Empire and its culture slowly mended over the following millennia. Though, as I mentioned before, the state of Elvenon at this time was a mere shadow of its former self. Knowledge of the Fade having been the sky of the world turned into magical stories of the great beyond visited in dreams. The self-titled gods and tyrants turned into legends and myths about benign creator deities, evil forgotten ones, and the banishment of both by the spiteful trickster known as the Dread Wolf. The Elven Empire of this period was historically still very vast, but were deprived of many of their earlier magical and technological advancements. With no access to the Illuvians and the Crossroads, Elvenon became a more decentralized realm. Still ruled from Arlathan, the communications from the distant lands of the Empire to the capital became less effective than it had been in previous ages. In the year 3000 FA, the elves made first contact with the dwarves underground. Whether this happened before or after the Vale is disputed, but what is certain is that when both these races first met each other, no humans had arrived on the continent, as stated in sources from both sides. And up until the arrival of said humans, the elves and dwarves seemingly lived in harmony with each other, both content with leaving the other alone to rule over the surface and underground, respectively. According to the Elven calendar, humans arrived in Thedas in the year 4500 FA, and despite what would later happen between the two races, evidence available to us from the sources and archaeological findings of the period suggests that the humans and elves peacefully coexisted with each other during a time after first contact. There were of course exceptions, when the largest human tribe, called the Neremenians, migrated to the continent and settled along the coast of the Nosen Sea in northern Thedas, they fought the local elves for control over the region. But overall, the two races traded and lived side by side in peace. This is corroborated mainly by underground ruins in the Brazilian forest in Ferelden, where buildings of human origin have been found bearing elvish architectural and cultural motifs and styles. An ancient spirit found at the site recounts that the ruins were indeed built by humans and had been a sort of cultural and religious sanctuary where elvish elders would come to slumber, either meaning entering Uthenera or being buried, and where the faithful could leave offerings to the gods. This period of interracial harmony between the elves and the newly arrived humans, who slowly started exploring the continent, lasted for hundreds of years, with the elves starting to call the humans Shemlan, meaning quicklings or quick children, in reference to their short lifespans in comparison to the elves. This early harmony would not last, however, as the human tribes grew more and more numerous and powerful. Having lost and forgotten most of their historical past, specifically concerning the real reason as to why their immortality had been lost, the elves instead started to blame the arrival of the Shemlin as the reason for this loss, for the quickening, as the elves started to call it. 
and soon enough, conflict started to erupt between the two races. In the year 6405 FA, the northern humans of Thedas united under a single banner, and the Tevinter Imperium was founded. This young realm, a magocracy ruled by magic users and worshipping strange foreign gods, stumbled upon ancient Arlathan and its surrounding forests during their expansion eastward, and after being met with hostility from the elves, decided to answer with all-out war. After six grueling years of besieging Arlathan, the mages of Tevinter resorted to forbidden blood magic, and finally sunk Arlathan into the ground in the year 6625 FA, destroying what little splendor of the ancient past that had still remained in the city. The elven civilization were once again torn asunder, with its people now enslaved for the second time in history, this time by the humans rather than their own kind. And what little remained of their culture and language after the fall of Arlathan, including the elven calendar, was outlawed and banned by their new Tevinter masters. Those few elves that managed to escape this cataclysm fled into the wilds. Some managed to hide underground in the dwarven city of Kadash Taig, but when the dwarves of Kal Shirok, a neighboring dwarven city, who were allies with Tevinter got wind of this, they attacked their fellow dwarves and destroyed the Taig and everyone in it, dwarf and elf alike. They feared that if Tevinter found out that dwarves had been helping elvish refugees from Arlathan, they would break off their profitable alliance with Kalsharok, something that the dwarves from Kalsharok could not risk. Some would argue that it was the decentralized nature of Elvanon at this period that made it susceptible to conquest by Tevinter. Others would blame Fenharel for tricking away the Evanuris from the world and them not being able to save them in their hour of need. Others still would claim that the Elven Empire of the post veil -Vale period was doomed to fail sooner or later. Tevinter was a carrion feasting upon a corpse. The corpse of Elvenon. With this followed more than 800 years of slavery and oppression for the elves of Thedas under the boot of the Tevinter Imperium, while their culture and heritage devolved even further. But as some of you might be aware of, History has a tendency to appear cyclical at times. Events like conquests, enslavement, and revolts repeating over and over again. And the elves would once again rise up against their enslavers. But this time, the opportunity for rebellion would come not from the elves themselves, but unexpectedly from other humans. In the year 7420 FA, or minus 180 ancient, the human prophet Andraste started a huge uprising against the mighty Tevinter Imperium, that at this point stretched across the entirety of Thedas. She started this rebellion in the name of her new god, the Maker. Slaves especially flocked to her side, and the uprising triggered local slave rebellions in many of the Tevinter provinces. The elven slaves of Tevinter, led by a man named Shartan, joined this uprising and fought Tevinter side by side with Andraste and their fellow slaves. As a reward for this participation in the revolt, the elves were granted a land of their own in southern Thedas, called the Dales and Shartan was declared a saint and martyr of the Chantry. This started what was called the Long Walk, an exodus by the disparate elves of the continent to reach their new homeland. In the Dales, 
the elves started rebuilding once again, and tried to salvage and reinvigorate what little remained of the elven culture of old. The old gods of the elven pantheon started to be worshipped again, and a new capital called Halam Shiral, meaning the end of the journey in elvish, were built in the style of old elvish architecture. As a very good example of cultural evolution, some elves even adapted the new human religion of Andraste and the Chant of Light, or mixed it with their existing religion and cultural beliefs. And to protect the independent nation and its borders, a military force named the Emerald Knights were founded, riding the white elvish stags known as Halas, and accompanied by loyal wolf companions, these warriors patrolled the forests of the Dales for any sign of threat. For almost 300 years, the Dales were the safe haven for elves in Thedas. However, seeking to revive the glory of elder days, and focus more on their own people rather than what was going on in the rest of the world, the Dales became increasingly isolationist, and distant towards its neighbouring countries. This, and the elves' overall unwillingness to convert to the faith of the Maker, led to tensions between them and the humans of the area, especially the burgeoning and zealous kingdom of Orle to their west. Orle also being the seat of the divine of Andraste's Chantry. After an incident between the two nations that were then known as a border raid, where elves had attacked the human settlement of Red Crossing, an event that we now know to be a misunderstanding involving two lovers, triggered war between the two nations. The Chantry, fueled by the conflict and religious zeal, called a crusade, an exalted march to defeat the heathen elves of the Dales for refusing the Maker's light. After some initial successes for the elves, the crusading force eventually conquered the Dales and drove its inhabitants out of their newly created homeland. Shartan was thrown down and excommunicated, being scrubbed from the archives of the Chantry. And so it was that the land that had been given to them by the first followers of Andraste had been taken away from the elves by the same zealous followers of Andraste because of a series of misunderstandings and mistakes. Truly, a dreadful irony of history. And the elven race was once again shattered. After the fall of the Dales, the Elves of Thedas split into two major cultural groups, which have persisted to this day. The City Elves, also called Alienage Elves, and the Dalish Elves. The City Elves have submitted to human rule, and live in the settlements and towns of the majority human nations of Thedas, but are regarded and treated as second-class citizens. They live in city-segregated areas called alienages, walled-off ghettos where crime and poverty are commonplace. Walled off, so that if a revolt or other tensions erupts, the alienage can swiftly be put into lockdown. Often left to their own devices by city guards and other authorities, city elves stake out a living as laborers, serfs, and servants to humans, but there are those in their desperation who will also turn to crime and petty theft. While allowed a certain type of self-governance with a haren, meaning elder in Elvish, as a community leader, this is not a political position, and the alienage culture, best symbolized by the communal venendal, a huge tree planted in the middle of the alienage and decorated by trinkets, meant to represent old Arlathan and the roots of the elven people, 
is a far, far cry from the culture of the old Dales or Arlathan. The Dalish elves, on the other hand, live very different lives from their cousins in the cities. Not wanting to submit to human rule, the Dalish elves have opted for a nomadic lifestyle and travel across the continent in self-sufficient clans, living off nature, animal husbandry, and in some cases trade. Named after their old homeland of the Dales, the Dalish see the preservation and survival of the old elven culture, language, and traditions as paramount, and the main reason why they live this particular lifestyle. The tales, legends, and customs, orally preserved, though some rare written historical texts remain in every clan, are taught to the younger generations of the Dalish, most often by a Dalish elder. A Dalish clan is led by a keeper, a mage who holds the title of both spiritual and cultural leader of the clan. Many a keeper claim noble ancestry to the former nobility of the Dales or the Emerald Knights. Domesticating the formerly mentioned Hala, a rare breed of stag said to have been first bred in Arlathan, these animals serve as companions to the clan that are herded and used to pull the clan's aravels. These are finely crafted land ships with often colorful sails that the Dalish use to travel over both land and sea. Speaking of fine craftsmanship, the Dalish pride themselves on just that. Particularly skilled are they in the crafting of iron bark, a rare sort of wood that is hardier and lighter than steel making it a perfect material for weapons and armor, but can also be used for tools and trinkets. The Dalish also tend to decorate the horns of their halas with beautiful markings and shapes, and such carved horns and iron bark tools are highly valuable and sought after in the rest of Thedas. The Dalish still worship the old elven gods of the Evanuris, seeing it as their duty to carry on these old religious beliefs. Even though the true history of the real gods of the Evanuris and a lot of their traditions have been lost to time, some religious practices and doctrines specifically tied to the gods or a specific god have survived or might possibly have been created later on as a cultural construction. One of these is the religious code of Andruil, the elven goddess of the hunt, known as the Vir Tandal, and is a very popular choice of lifestyle for Dalish hunters. Another code is the Way of Peace, or Vir Atishan, associated with the goddess Silace, and focuses on learning medicine, herbalism, and the crafts of the healer. Dalish tribes are by their nature solitary and usually keep to themselves. Occasional interactions with humans and other elves do occur sometimes, but not very often. The exception to this is an event called Arlathven, meaning for love of the people, that occurs once every ten years where all the Dalish tribes meet at a predetermined location. This meeting is a chance for the disparate clans to meet and socialize with each other, while the leaders and keepers of the tribes meet and discuss news, the old ways, findings, and then recount the losses and lessons of Arlathan and the Dales. One of the most striking cultural phenomenon of the Dalish is that they still use the Valaslin, the facial tattoos that are known as blood writings. The Dalish elves are given the tattoos when they come of age, and wear them with pride, as they see them as marks of unity and patronage towards the gods. The tattoos also distinguish the Dalish from both city elves and humans, and as they see it, is the clearest symbol of their uniqueness and the reverence they have for their traditions and history. Sadly, 
the Dalish are unaware of the true meaning behind these face tattoos. And this is but one of many examples of how the few things that are left of the past, lacking the proper historical facts and context, have been misconstrued or misinterpreted into something completely different. Since there is no longer an elven homeland or independent nation of elves in Thedas, elves live in all imaginable parts of Thedas. Every major city and settlement houses an alienage, and even though the Dalish are nomadic in nature, popular places for tribes to live in are, for example, around the Brazilian forest in Ferelden, or parts of their old homeland in the Dales known as the Exalted Marches. Elves, both city and Dalish variants, can virtually be encountered in any nation in any part of Thedas. Just as desperate as their former inhabitants, elvish ruins of cities, temples, towers and burial places, just to name a few, are dotted across the landscape of the continent. A stark reminder of its ancient elvish past. Recently, however, there have been discoveries of certain types of elves that fit into neither of the two aforementioned cultural groups. A kind that harkens back to the ancient past of Elvenon. In southern Thedas, in an area known as the Arbor Wilds, there exists a type of elves that claim to have been present since the fall of ancient Arlathan and the creation of the Vale, calling themselves Sentinel Elves. They are wholly dedicated to the cult of Mythal bearing her Valaslin on their faces. Apparently, these sentinel elves have persisted in isolation this long by entering Uthenera and awakening only when their temple of Mythal is threatened. Though living far from other civilizations, they are aware of the existence of other nations and of the elves and humans. Their cultural surroundings and sense of higher purpose makes them distrustful towards both humans and, interestingly enough, other elves, whom they regard as nothing better than Shemlin, their ancient splendor lost and spent. And although these sentinel elves might be one of the few examples of genuine prevail elven culture, that have managed to survive up until modern times, they themselves struggle to keep their cultural heritage alive, isolated and few as they are. Although only encountered in the Arbor Wilds, there have been reports of sentinel elves in the vast forest region of Tirashan in western Orlais. This might be an indication that maybe there are more of these strange ancient elves out there, hidden in the forgotten places of the continent. As we have seen with the Valaslin, modern Dalish elves and elves overall are unaware of the true history and context behind much of their ancient past and culture. This in large part due to the source material being either destroyed, forgotten or misinterpreted, in its modern, incomplete form. Nowhere is this clearer than with the elven gods of the Evanuris. This is a very interesting and important topic to delve into from many different angles, historically, anthropologically, ethnologically, etc. So let us then, so we can clearly picture the two vastly different sides of the coin, Look first at the elven gods as they are viewed and worshipped today in modern Thedas, and contrast it to what we know of the actual fake gods of the Evanuris during the Golden Age of Elvenon. The elven pantheon is made up of nine deities, five of which are male and four are female. The leaders of this pantheon were Elganan the Allfather, and Mithal, the Allmother. Elganan is the god of the sun and vengeance, the paternal father of the other gods and the elves. 
while his wife Methal was his maternal counterpart, being the goddess of protection, motherhood, love, and justice. The two eldest children of the All-Mother and the All-Father are Falon Din, the god of fortune and death who guides the deceased through the underworld, and Dirthamen, the god of knowledge and secrets. Then comes the younger sisters, Andril, who we have mentioned earlier, the goddess of the hunt, nature and animals, and her sister Silace, the goddess of the hearth, healing and magic. June, the husband of Silace and the god of craftsmanship, is sometimes referred to as a child of Elganon and Methal, and sometimes not, as with some of the other gods. While the goddess Gilanine, according to legend, was a mortal who was granted godhood by Andruil for serving her faithfully in life, turning her into the mother of the Hala and the goddess of traveling and navigation. And last, of course, is Fenharel, the dread wolf, betrayer and trickster of the Evanures. The myths and legends surrounding the Elven Pantheon are pretty standard in nature as far as polytheistic religions go. Tales of how the world was created, the source of the gods' powers, and the relationship between each other are very common. Tales involving the gods with the purpose of teaching certain moral lessons to the worshipper and so on are also very frequent. The Evanuris is also contrasted as often fighting a war against the Forgotten Ones, who are the polar opposites of the Evanuris, evil and malicious gods and entities. Fenharel, being depicted sometimes as part of the Evanuris, sometimes as part of the evil Forgotten Ones, or sometimes a mix of both, takes up a role similar to that of Loki or Hermes in our own mythologies a cunning trickster who manages to slink out of problems with the use of his wits, and it is usually his tricks and pranks that drives the narrative of the elven myths forward. And the thing he is most known for in elven myth, that being tricking both the Evanuris and the Forgotten Ones from this realm, has earned him a mixed response from worshippers of the elven gods. Although rare shrines to the Dreadwolf can be found, he is often seen as an evil or capricious entity that should be feared or at least not easily trusted. Many Dalish elves warn their kin not to be fooled, tricked or led astray by the Dreadwolf in their lives, and even invoke him in curses like Dreadwolf take you. Religious practices during the periods of elven history seem to be quite similar throughout time, though varying in scale, from large and extravagant during the ancient days to more regional or local in the modern day. Religious practices or ceremonies were performed to the gods or to a specific god in their respective temples or shrines, tended to by chosen priests, servants and champions. There are also specific places in nature that served as holy places to the gods, and the ordinary worshippers carried out their religious duties by visiting these holy places, leaving offerings and praying to the gods to show piety or beg for aid or answers. But as we know from earlier in the lesson, the benevolent deities of the Evanuris is very much an incorrect view of the elven gods. In reality, the Evanuris were not gods, but a group of incredibly powerful elven mages, driven by greed and lust for power. The power that they wielded arrogantly led them to believe that they were basically gods in comparison to the average elf. And with this hubris in mind, and the scarce but impactful source material left to us of how these tyrants acted, we get quite a clear picture of who the Evanuris actually were. Elganon was wrathful and impatient, terrible in his wrath when angered, burning land and earth whenever he wished, 
It is said he once came to blows with Falondin, and decided, with Mithal's interjection, to end the matter by letting appointed champions fight each other to settle the matter and avoid conflict between the other Evanuris. After his own champion was victorious, he forced thousands of slaves to build a monument to him, commemorating this victory and proclaiming him first among the gods. This shows just how petty and utterly devoid of empathy these beings were. Falondin was just as wrathful and narcissistic as Elganon, maybe even more so. According to Solas, as our main source, Falondin started numerous fights with the other members of the Pantheon in order to gain more followers and worshippers, and only stopped after Mithal, with the other gods as her allies, stormed his temple grounds and forced him to cease. Andril, the Huntress, also known as the Goddess of Sacrifice, sometimes grew bored with the offerings of animals to her and demanded human sacrifices, and were infamous for hunting not only animals, but other elves. To her, they could both indifferently be considered prey, if she so wished. And the haughtiness of Silace and the rivalry she harbored against the other gods was well known at this time. It is certain that aspects of the real Evanuris, mainly Mithal and Fenharel, were voices of reason and logic, but these events do not put the elven gods, gods in quotation marks, in a very flattering light, quite the opposite. Given the polytheistic nature of the elven pantheon, the faith of the elves have not been on very good terms with the Chantry of Thedas. The Chantry being, of course, a monotheistic belief in a singular god, the Maker, and his prophet Andraste. And even though Shartan, a elf who fought side by side with Andraste, was declared during a certain time as a martyr and a saint, this was later revoked due to the crusade against the Dales. It is safe to say that these two religions are not very kindly inclined towards one another. Moving on to our last topic, the Elven language. Elvish as a language is today very fragmented and has lost much of its meaning, purpose, and most importantly, most of its fluent speakers after the fall of Arlathan and the Dales. Modern city elves have a very limited knowledge of their own tongue, and might only know a few words from person to person, opting instead to use the human language of the land that they live in. The Dalish elves have a more complete view of the language, and speak it more extensively or even fluently. Written elvish is close to being extinct, but various examples of texts have been found in ancient ruins, temples, and so forth. Various institutions have taken it upon themselves to compile and translate Elvish texts, and the knowledge of written Elvish is a highly prestigious skill of the Dalish keepers, who keep it alive for as long as they serve as leaders and passing on its secrets to their successors. There are also many verbal and modern examples of Elvish in everything from song, poems, lullabies, and everything in between. As opposed to other Theodosian languages, Elvish has a very distinct linguistic structure, and also avoids the phenomenon of hard consonants. We have already encountered a few words in Elvish during the lesson, like Shem, or Shemlen, meaning human or quickling, more literally, or Haren, meaning elder. Examples of common elven phrases could be Andra Natishan, a greeting meaning enter this place in peace, or Maseranas, meaning thank you or my thanks. The history of the elves and their culture is one central to Thedas' own history. Being one of the first inhabitants of the continent, themes of glory, revolt, suffering, and slavery have followed the elves through time. Suppression and slanderous words like knife ear are common in Thetis. But the winds of change 
might be blowing. For throughout the forests and groves of the Dalish, the alienages of the city elves, and even the temples of the sentinels, the rumor has spread that the dread wolf, Fenharel, has awoken from his slumber once again, and are gathering elves to his side to take back that what was once theirs, the glory of older days. This is probably just that, a rumor, but only time will tell what the future holds for Thedas' elves. That's all for today's lesson. You have a lot of literature about elvish history and linguistics to read through, so I will let you go. Until next time, I have been Professor Absalom, and I will see you in the next lesson. Thank you very much for watching this video. This was quite a long one, and it took some time to make, but I hope you like it nonetheless. Uh, I have now decided on the format of this series. It will be an out-of-universe one, but other future lore series might vary depending on what fits best. This video was an overview of the elves of Dragon Age, and I will do the same thing with the other races in future videos. The info was on mostly a basic level, and future, more in-depth videos, as I mentioned, about certain events or characters will come in the future, so that you guys won't miss out on, you know, any context or missing lore. Uh, once again, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment for the algorithm. And I will see you all in the next video. Until then, have a good one.